we shouldn't imagine that we're just going to get a twenty thousand dollar home loan and decarbonize our whole house. You could do that, but that's not the most common way. More commonly, like you said, people are going to have something that's breaking or just broke, and they need to replace it. And so now is the time to spend money. And I'm going to get the electrified version. That means you have like a like an eight year horizon. Like you could get your whole house done by 2030, and that would be great for the planet. Yeah. Welcome to Home Green Homes podcast. I am Izumi Tanaka, a green home advisor and a green realtor. Here I invite a variety of experts in the world of green homes and have conversations about how we can all live in healthy, resilient, and efficient homes. My guests provide insight in a wide range of topics from designing, building, and living in green homes, purchasing or financing green homes and improvements, to how we can live to reduce the negative environmental impact from the way we live. My goal is to inspire and inform you about how we can make a difference in our own lives and our environment. Hello, this is Izumi Tanaka with Home Green Homes Podcast. Today, I have Sean Armstrong from Redwood Energy. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm going to let you ex- uh, tell us who you are and what you do. So, Sean, tell me what you do and who you are. Okay, um, I'm Sean Armstrong. I am the founding partner. It's Michael Winkler and I. And we run a business called Redwood Energy since 2011. And we founded it to be an all electric consultancy that did 100% solar offset on just affordable housing. So very niche, but we had found that that niche was a place where the incentives were aligned, where the government Mm -hmm. agencies would value the impact of solar in predicting utility bills. They were able to solve the quote unquote split incentive. There are lots of incentives there in terms of rebates and tax credits. And we found that we could do 100% solar offset apartment complexes for low-income households. And we've been successful because um, that that specific, that little group, that is five of the 10 largest developers of of zero net energy housing in North America, including Canada, are are clients here in California that are doing 100% offset apartment complexes, all electric. So um, yeah. I've been having a great time for the last 11 years now, um, consulting to affordable housing developers. That's an exciting story. So c- tell us what, why decarbonize and what's the, what's the big deal? I, I'm just being kind of facetious here, but um, you know, many states are now starting, states and cities and counties are starting to ban gas and new construction. Um, let's talk about why we should be thinking about decarbonizing. Okay. Well, you know, this can be theory for people um, until someone in your family dies Mm -hmm. for lack of decarbonizing. So in 2017, there was a a really catastrophic wildfire outside of Santa Rosa. And that morning, my mother-in-law at the time was going to going to the hospital because she had a lung issue. She'd Mm -hmm. been coughing a lot that fall. There'd been wildfires in Oregon when we came back from the, the, um, the solar eclipse really bad fires. She'd been coughing. She'd had lung damage when she was a kid. She had cancer and radiation therapy in the 60s. It damaged her whole chest. Mm -hmm. So her whole life, she'd been working with like a little bit of heart damage, a little lung damage. And the smoke from the fire killed her. And she was trying to go to the hospital that morning when the fires broke out and the hospital shut down because Mm -hmm. the fire was literally next to the hospital. So she couldn't get her doctor's appointment. And she, um, we didn't know that she should flee. She should run for her life from Santa Rosa because the smoke made her cough all week long. And then she died the following Monday. And then they brought her back to life in the hospital and turned her into tube lady. And then about a month later, she died. And then they shocked her back to life. And, they, and then she lived for another month as tube lady, not being able to talk, oh only write little notes basically. And then she tapped out the third time saying, I, you know, all of her vitals crashed. She, she was 90 pounds, a five foot 10 woman. Oh my God. There was nothing left to her, it was just a skeleton. It was mm-hmm. one of the most miserable ways I can imagine dying. <laughs> it is a nightmare of dying. I am so sorry. To be fully conscious while your 
well that you know like tubes in every orifice just the horror so that that grotesquerie which is i mean she she died slow and multiple times where other people died in fires in their cars you know up here in local news of people dying in their cars whole families of kids roasted alive mm -hmm. you know where they could be caught and one kid's still alive but that kid dies in the hospital three days later. like it was so traumatic and these fires been going on every summer where my friends have been fleeing from the mountains and camping in my backyard and having their homes burned down or just so many crazy fires since 2017, terrifying fires. Mm -hmm. um, my children's best friend was a refugee from paradise who watched people on fire in their cars as they, as they fled paradise, the town. And then she's relocated by some nice landlord next door and the kid came over and was playing with my kids as like a new kid in town. It was really intensely traumatic just to hear what this seven-year-old had been through. And so it is, we are past the point in which we get to discuss the hypotheticals of climate change or to pretend that invisible pollution is non-existent pollution, you know? Like hundreds of years ago, we got past, we got into germ theory, the idea like, no, there wasn't spontaneous generation of flies. That was, those were from eggs and those turned into real things. And where we said invisible things are still real. Mm -hmm. And I'm just here to tell you, man, there's nothing more real than a fire coming after you personally, physically, or, or choking to death on smoke. It's just, it, it is intensely real. So that is, you know, <laughs> you know, I read about climate change in my eighth grade science book. I have my 1990 Scientific American cover issue of climate change. Like we've been watching this in real time in politics and science since about 1978 when the hearings first started in the Senate with Al Gore. Okay, so now we got, <laughs> now we got wildfires killing people. Mm -hmm. We're here mm -hmm. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So are you saying that by electrifying or eliminating the uh, uh, yeah. fossil fuel <laughs> yeah. from our homes? The big reveal, we need to stop burning things into the atmosphere so it doesn't you know, create climate change. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so my career started at a practical level is because of the 2006 um, Climate Change Act here in California called the Global Warming Solutions Act. Schwarzenegger signed into office, signed into law. And then Bush, the next year, signed into law the equivalent federal legislation, both of which called for 2020 to be all electric building codes with 100% solar power for federal buildings. And then also the state had called for that. So when I, when I started in 2007, a new affordable housing company, I was pursuing just those funds mm -hmm. saying, we can solve climate change. 2006, that's our, our state law, right? We'll solve climate change by doing all electric buildings and pairing it with solar and using the rebates and using the tax credits to incentivize that while solar was very expensive in the first five years or so of, of 2007, like 2012, when solar prices dropped precipitously. Um, so yeah, it is well-known federal and state law that we have to do all electric construction. Mm -hmm. And there is no scientist that disagrees with that. And mm -hmm. we are only delaying the inevitable while our friends, family members die. Well, mm -hmm. islands get submerged while we you know, precipitate the fastest climate change that looks like we've seen in geologic history. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, this is a wild time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all gonna it, in, indeed, indeed. And now we are again in the fire season. So yeah. we're bracing ourselves to, to be prepared. But um, so, so as you said that there are a lot of government incentives available for um, electrifying homes. And, and when you are talking about affordable housing, uh, multiple uh, multifamily units, right? Uh, so those are apartment buildings and um, uh, low income housing, is that, yeah. is that included? Okay. So what are the kind of incentives that are available still today, tw we're, we're now 2022, and um, how are we doing? Well, there is a lot of work being done in states and at the federal government right now. So this would be mm -hmm. a long list, but mm -hmm. very briefly, there's still a 26% tax credit mm -hmm. for doing solar rays. There is a new tax credit for installing heat pumps. There are, so those are federal, to mm -hmm. encourage you to electrify, solarize. 
there um the at the state level in california I'm most familiar with build and tech which are mostly affordable housing oriented but there is still in the build program a whole bunch of money for electrifying and these are like 1500 to 3000 dollar um tax i mean like cash i should say mm -hmm. cash payments dude mm -hmm. where that's a significant chunk of money right then there's the investor owned utilities like pg e socal gas etc and they have very modest incentives they don't really change your behavior it's kind of for show in my opinion mm -hmm. um so that's it sort of like the everyone scale mm -hmm. within affordable housing the the affordable housing rebate, like the, the money that's given out every year, there's about a billion dollars in tax credits given to affordable housing developers each year to, to require them then to lower the cost of the rents. So about 30% of an affordable housing development is usually paid for with some sort of incentives. And that gets you that 20 to 30% discount in rents. Okay, mm -hmm. so in that world, they are now starting to require all electric construction um so housing community developments which does then state funds and they have 750 million dollars of state funds they're putting in so now we have 1.75 billion dollars in federal and state funds being put into affordable housing each year in california which is remarkable that's mm -hmm. building like 15 percent of the housing in california each year granted about 40 percent of californians are low income so we're not building the housing still to this day even with our extra super duper efforts we're still right. participating in this crisis. Nonetheless, in affordable housing, they're requiring it to be all electric. They're strongly incentivizing it to be, be all electric. They continue to incentivize solar rays on the roof. <clears throat> and they're trying to standardize the solution to the split incentive in affordable housing, where it's a situation be like an owner wants to invest in solar and energy efficiency, but knows that it's gonna raise the cost about $12,000 per apartment to do it, to make it zero net energy and can't afford that because the funding agencies only give money out in a competitive way. If you mm -hmm. ask for more money, you might not get any money. So this tension, how do you pay for it? In affordable housing, they've solved it where they say, you can raise the rents for the same amount of dollars that you lower the utility bills so that the people don't pay any more per month for rent and utilities. But now it's not gonna be a variable utility bill issue where like summertime mm -hmm. bills are super high. Right. And so high. Cause your solar array solves it. So you have, that is is becoming a very robust part of affordable housing right now and that's exciting to see yeah well but so let me ask you about this in affordability and incentives though the and when you said heat pump is you are referring to water heater and the hvac the uh, space space heating and cooling system as well right i am yeah um, so a heat pump is a reversible air conditioner Right. Air conditioners, they move heat from one place to another, like from your house to the outside. And you, if you call it a heat pump, that means it's reversible, it does both right. in the summer it air conditions, in the winter it heats. And if you call it a heat pump on a water heater, in that case, it's actually just single speed. It just pulls heat out of the air and sticks it into the water heater. Mm -hmm. So these devices are so fundamental because they are essentially a renewable energy device. They collect the heat from the air that the sun has made. And so they're kind of like a souped up solar thermal collector on the roof or like a better solar electric panel they, there they collect usually three or four times as much energy as they actually use to collect it because the energy is in the air so right. yeah in electrifying we've been trying to focus on heat pumps because they are also such a big renewable energy collector as opposed to just burning electricity directly like a toaster oven element or something in a water heater or space heating right. now we right. got heat pumps yeah so so i'm going to go back to the affordability so um, I know that it's, this is my frustration. Uh, I, have, I have sent a bunch of friends who are about to either replace the water heater or HVAC uh, you know, to, to go look for heat pumps. And even with the incentives that may be available in, in respective uh, locality, it's still a lot more expensive than the traditional gas model yeah so so what do you what do you say about that <laughs> what do you have to okay. say <laughs> well I, I'd, I'd say that you know gas is so radically inefficient it is such a terrible idea to say 
take a unit of gas and burn it at 60% efficient, as opposed to using that same unit of electricity and getting 400% efficiency out of your heat pump because you collected all that energy instead of burning something. Mm -hmm. So the, the unfortunate thing is that you're comparing apples and rotten bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Biden administration just two days ago, today is what it, we had done. Today's Thursday, Thursday the 16th. Thursday the 16th. So I think mm -hmm. on uh, the 14th, the Biden administration announced that they were going to increase the standards for furnaces on gas to say you can't be 80% efficient, you have to be 95% efficient. Mm -hmm. That's a condensing furnace that costs a lot more money. And now the, the more expensive but somewhat efficient gas device will be compared to the efficient heat pump and we'll start getting apples to apples and you won't be able to buy non-condensing, crappy, old, junky gas water heaters and <laughs> or specifically in this case, furnaces, gas mm -hmm. furnaces. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing is that the price is gonna go up in essence because efficiency is gonna be more highly valued. Um, mm -hmm. Just so you know, United States is, is a state, is, as a country is famous for not valuing energy efficiency. Like you know, the rest of the world, Eurasia, you know, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, including over in Japan, you know, other side of the, mm -hmm. the Pacific, that mm -hmm. whole huge land mass pursues heat pumps and energy efficiency in a way that we can't even imagine in the United States. Mm -hmm. We're stuck in this. <laughs> so yes. We, we have old crappy standards. We haven't changed them since 1980. So we're still mm -hmm. allowed to buy crappy old car made which really inefficient um, compared to like supercomputer heat pumps. You know, it's like an abacus compared to a supercomputer. <laughs> which one's going to be cheaper? Which one does more? <laughs> right, right. So it's it's like I said, it's it's really frustrating for me. Um, uh, I I may I may kind of detour a little bit, but um, I've gone to appliance stores, and I actually I I call one appliance stores in Los Angeles one day, and I ask if 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 they have induction stove. And they say, oh no, we don't carry that because they stopped making it, right? And then, and then I walk into another appliance store and the salesperson walked right up to me and said, hi, can I help you? And I said, yes, I am looking for induction stove. And, and the lady said, well, we, uh, we don't have any on the floor, but you can order. And, and then I said, okay, thank you. And I walked around the floor and this is a big appliance store and they had the first section they had was stoves and ranges. And probably out of maybe a hundred models they had, they, they actually had two inductions and she didn't even know it. So, so okay, what, so is, what is wrong with this picture? Get in a mental airplane and land in Japan. Okay, now go into a big box there because my brother did this for me and he took photos of the interior of the, one of these big box appliance stores and there's lines and lines of induction ranges. It was walls full of heat pumps. There was almost nothing that sold gas because Japan is famous for being extremely efficient with electricity and converting lots of different gas devices into electricity and kitchens and heat pumps. They're, they're really the best at design. Mm -hmm. Instead of being in California, which is a petro state, you know, we were founded as a petro state. In, 19, well, in 2000, essentially, because of our energy crisis, our state tried to stop all electric which was something that let's say California really started in the 50s and 60s. We have like all these wonderful all electric communities that are built in Southern California. But the energy crisis where gas, a gas scam essentially raised our electricity prices tenfold overnight and crashed our state's governance because we had a recall election as a consequence. We got a new governor Schwarzenegger. For 20 years, California has been trying to stop all electric design. Unlike the South, so get in that airplane and also go to Georgia, where 80% of new construction is all electric. And yeah, oh, if you go wow. into the big box there, you have a whole different array of options compared to the petro state of California that's been trying to stop all electric design for 20 years and only stopped officially like the staff, pg e all of them stopped in 2017 intellectually. And our code still is, an, is a gas friendly code and is hostile to all electric, our 2019 code. It's only the code that starts at the end of this year, finally, that will say heat pumps are favored and it requires a heat pump either as the water heater or as the space heater in all new construction. And it is a heat pump code. Mm -hmm. This is the first time. And, and it's not even now, right? It's, in, it's like six months from now that this happens. So you're living in, a, in a, an apocalyptic anti-efficiency state called California. 
<laughs> then it's like gas everywhere gas 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 burn it all <laughs> number one hookups in the country for gas right number one hookups per capita when there's their last 10 years one percent of construction is all electric in california from 2011 to 2019 one percent and of that one percent redwood energy my firm did 52 percent of it apartments wow. low-income housing was fully half of everything being done in the state and the other developers of affordable housing doing all electric solar power design probably make up another 20 percent or so and it's just well-off people building all electric homes with solar and trailer homes which are frequently all electric and that makes up the final balance it's we're the worst and so yes. you live in the, the hardest place in our country <laughs> to go out and find an induction stove <laughs> that's actually uh, my pet peeve so do you think that um do you foresee that the prices would come down as we become more electrified like um you know right now my my uh i think i think you were on the panel about the missing middle or that was not maybe that was a different webinar but i how i see it is that in the real estate market in the higher end uh, properties, you know, money can buy anything basically, right? So they can put all kinds of what we considered energy efficiency uh, features and all the green, what we call green features. And then the, uh, in the lower affordable housing level, there's a lot of incentives and, you know, subsidies available. But when you are talking about the middle, you know, the middle, that's a big market. And if my friend who is wanting to change the water heater to heat pump and, and even looking for incentives and still can't afford it, right? So what do you have any tips for homeowners who are wanting to electrify or decarbonize because they do care, but they're, they're, the budget is limited? Do you have any, what is your suggestion? What's your tips? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, having a gas stove is the same thing as smoking about a pack of cigarettes a day inside the house for everyone else's health. It's just the same as secondhand cigarette smoke, according to studies being done since 1995. Over and over and over, gas stoves, just the normal amount of cooking that people do in a gas stove using house, is the same as secondhand cigarette smoke and causing asthma in adults and children, heart attacks, cardiopulmonary disease in general, and cancer <clears throat> like it is terrible it is just because it's invisible combustion because it doesn't look like you know a half a pack of cigarettes burning underneath the pan it is <laughs> and so it there it is the easiest one to fix and the most important for your personal health which is to go get a 50 dollars countertop induction range ikea sells them for 50 bucks just a single burner mm -hmm. try it out Discover that it boils water twice as fast. It's easier to control so you don't burn your eggs. You get the, just the right temperature for hot cocoa. All these things, like discover that it's a way better cooking experience with 50 bucks of investments in it. And then if you have 200 or $300, go get a better two burner one. And then you'll mm -hmm. have three. One for you know, like one circuit over that part over here and you cook three different things. Or trust me, it's totally a better idea and go get Eurodib. And Eurodib is the best of the two burner ones. I've used them in, in like I have a tiny house rental and it worked for almost five years. The, the countertop 200 to $300 ones, they're not durable. They're not designed. Mm -hmm. It's like your popcorn popper isn't designed to last for 20 years, especially if you use it every day. So you just know that if you're spending $300 on a Euro dib, two burner induction range or a $200 ducks top or new wave, like there's, there's some pretty good brands. You can see in like the four stars, whatever in Amazon, like they'll work. Um, and just decarbonize your kitchen. Stop smoking cigarettes in the house, especially <laughs> with kids. You know, open a window while you're smoking cigarettes in the house. Try to get a fan going so you blow the cigarette smoke out. <clears throat> but don't like casually think that smoking cigarettes in the house doesn't have an impact on your health. <clears throat> he says as he, he coughs for a second. Pardon me, Blake. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, um, that's the cheapest and easiest one is your kitchen. And it's also the most health impactful. Mm -hmm. The second easy thing to do is if you have a gas dryer and only 10% of dryers sold in our country are gas anymore. 
Are they oh, any wow. gas dryer? You only find them in California. They're pretty much non-existent in the rest of the country. Who would buy a gas dryer? Plumbing gas all the way to the dryer, and then you have to plumb out the exhaust because it's a dirty gas device. Like, who does this? So if you're so unfortunate as to still have a gas dryer, then go out and get what everyone else in the world uses, which is a condensing washer dryer. LG makes the best one. It's a 4.5 cubic foot, and you can plug it into any outlet. Like any 120 outlet that's nearby, you can just plug it in, and now you've got a really good washing machine. Like your clothes come out awesome. And it's a really good water extractor, which many washing machines aren't. So therefore it doesn't use much energy to dry the laundry because most of it got spun out. Okay, so now you have like an $1,800 investment in a really nice dryer, but you got rid of the, got rid of the, the, the bad, not very good gas dryer. You got a great <laughs> washing machine out of it. <clears throat> okay. And you can also get them without the washing machine, just get a condensing dryer that plugs into any outlet. And you can get electric resistance out dryers that plug into any outlet. They take longer. That's just what you need to know. They just take longer, less power, mm -hmm. but you can plug it into any outlet. Then the, the water heater, that's gonna be like $4,000 to install. So that's not a casual thing. We've gone right. from like for $200, $300, then we went up to 2,000, now we're yeah. at 4,000 for the water. That's the big ticket item. <clears throat> that's the big one. Mm -hmm. And so you, that's a heat pump water heater, but you can put in a, a plug in anywhere, 30 gallon electric resistance tank. So if you just want to get rid of the gas and you have solar up on your roof, you're like, oh, I'm going to use the inefficient electric resistance. Yeah, it uses four times as much electricity. Yes, that amount of electricity equals me driving 12,000 miles a year in an electric car. So yes, get a heat pump water heater, that energy savings compared to electric resistance, 3,000 kilowatt hours a year is all the driving you'll do. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, but if you're just cheap up front, got to get her done, go get a 30 gallon electric resistance water heater. It, it meets your needs for like three showers in a row. Really? It's, who does that? That's, that's plenty of showering. <laughs> um, and then, it, you know, heats back up. The, the last one, the space heating system, that's 5,500 per ton. And a ton is um, in the old world. Back in the day when you literally had a ton of ice and you look at the amount of cooling it would do over 24 hours, you would call that a ton. That's 12,000 BTUs mm -hmm. per hour. All these things are just numbers. It's like a ton of ice, you can sort of think of it. And that's, so a heat pump that can do that much work over a day is, is uh, $5,500. And you usually have two tons to three tons in a house. Mm -hmm. So your budget is 12,000 to like $17,000 to put in heat pumps. But, you can get portables that just plug in anywhere. And Medea and Toshiba rebrands that makes an ultra quiet, ultra quiet, high efficiency. Basically, it has a computer in it. It's the only one of the portable heat pumps that has a computer. And the computer makes it way quiet and, like, you know, one fourth as loud, genuinely quiet, pleasant. Your baby can sleep next mm -hmm. to it. I gave one to one of my staff who just had a baby and she's down in LA and there's 10 people in the house and she's got a portable air conditioner and she can just sit there and nurse next to the portable air conditioner and everyone's like this is fantastic <laughs> how big of a so, space does it cool well my my partner you know he has a ground source heat pump he has like palo alto money from back in the day so ground <laughs> source heat pump after 20 years pg e fried it with an electrical pulse this happened just this winter and so we got one of the portable heat pumps that we've been trying out put it in his house and it heats his entire house <clears throat> it's 1500 square feet 1950s house he reinsulated it and he heats the whole house and he says it's even quieter than his ground source oh, wow. because it doesn't use the duct work it just blows from one spot and you don't really hear it after like in a different room so the the option of a portable heat pump is only 700 dollars per ton if and, and you don't want any other brand than the medea m-i-d-d-a mm -hmm. which is the mm -hmm. highest quality brand mm -hmm. in china <clears throat> it's like a chinese manufacturer mm -hmm. so <clears throat> pardon me that's um you can get a, a 700 dollars portable heat pump and plug it in anywhere as long as you have a window that goes up and down mm -hmm. and up and down window to work mm -hmm. with and that gets you right back into being a renter like if you if you have 700 dollars of heat pump you can get turn off the gas wall furnace that are so often in rentals like like leak gas into your house because you can smell the methane when you come in that often leak carbon monoxide. If there's even a small breeze outside, 
you're getting carbon monoxide blown back into your house and it's poisoning you. One of those like invisible odorless poisons that fossil fuels famously make. So that's your four, four, four choices there. <clears throat> Is, and, and you have the portable heat pump option, but if you, mm -hmm. you go the other routes, you have to have at least $5,000 in your bank account. So it's right. a system or so, $700. What I'm hearing is that is if you are a homeowner, uh, every time uh, you uh, wanted to or needing to replace a appliance just to go to electric version rather than yeah. gas, right? Like it, it, it involves month. heat, right? You just do this incremental thing. Right. But if your water heater breaks as they do unpredictably yes it's best to said well i have an older water heater i'm going to replace it with a heat pump now yeah <clears throat> don't wait for a problem because then right you you frequently well something to know is that ream this summer is selling a retrofit ready heat pump water heater that you can plug into anywhere mm. as opposed to having a special wiring we've been developing this for years now with them mm -hmm. redwood energy has the community of decarbonizers have i have one in my house <clears throat> it's it's works great i can fill a whole clawfoot bathtub and the um and you, i just plugged it into an outlet on my porch as opposed to having running a special 240 volt 30 amp wire like you'd usually do to a heat pump water heater mm -hmm. it just plugs into any outlet um wow. then, yeah so it's like it's 900 watts instead of 4500 watts wow. that's that huge difference it's it's one fifth as much electricity being used by it so that for water heaters, you don't want to wait for it to break. You know, it just sucks. All of a sudden, you can't right. shower, and it takes like a week right. to get fixed anyway because mm -hmm. the plumber's mm -hmm. busy. So, like, just that's the one that you might want to do in ahead of time. Right. So, so how you mentioned the renters. So, what if you are renting apartments, and if your landlord is not conscientious and not willing to spend their money to give you electric version of anything. Are there anything that that renters can do without having to spend a lot of money? Yeah, I mean, all over the world, you find two burner induction ranges used in rentals. Like you go to Israel and you stay in an Airbnb or something, it's like there's a two burner electric resistance hot plate in your rental. So that's easy. Anyone can buy those. The condensing washer dryers as mentioning, the reason those are so popular, particularly in Europe, is because they have hundreds, many hundreds year old buildings that they are still occupying as rentals. Mm -hmm. And those, you don't need a landlord because they plug into any outlet and they're small. Mm -hmm. you know, they do both washing and drying, so they take half the space. So you can have mm -hmm. your own washer and dryer in a rental frequently. Often that isn't even like space provided for that. Mm -hmm. You can just have it put a little butcher block on top and roll it around in your kitchen as if it was a table, but then plug it into your sink to get rid of the mm, water. That's I how see. my babysitter did it when I was growing up in the like rural Wisconsin. She rolled the washing machine over and that's, that's a <laughs> very common in, in, in like Western Europe, Western yeah. Asia. To roll it around in some old stone apartment complex, you know, and the same thing with the portable heat pumps. Those, mm -hmm. you don't need to ask a landlord. The only thing you have to work with a landlord that you have to is the water heater. Mm -hmm. but you can do most of the decarbonizing work you need to do without the landlord's help. Now, once you have all the uh, appliances replaced with elect electrified version, and if you don't have solar panels yet, um, do you know if that is still going to be more efficient than and financially on the utility cost? Yeah. In Okay, so if you take a heat pump water heater, it's yellow tags from the Department of Energy. Like when you buy appliances, mm -hmm. you frequently see a yellow tag on its side telling you what its predicted utility bills are based upon average electricity and average mm -hmm. gas prices in the country. And mm -hmm. the Department of Energy knows what the averages are. Mm -hmm. So if you take a gas on demand water heater mm -hmm. from AO Smith and their heat pump water heater from AO Smith, which I have done, and the very best, best on demand gas, the most efficient is a utility bill of like $140 a year. And the heat pump in that same equivalent would be like $90 a year. On average in the country, most states, most utilities, you'd be much better served to have a heat pump using house than any gas device. It's definitely true when you're running it on propane. Propane's way expensive compared to electricity. So if you are electrifying your home 
you can electrify your space heating system and you can call up the utility and say, I would like, I have an electric space heating system now. And they'll say, oh, okay, we'll give you more electricity at a low cost. And you, you'll say, oh, good. That means my utility bills don't go up this winter. Terrific. That's how it's supposed to work in California. But you can't call them up and say, I also have a heat pump water heater. Give me an extra allowance, please, for the other doubling, essentially, because gas, space heating and mm -hmm. gas water heating are about the same amount of gas being used. So they don't give you more cheap electricity when you put in a heat pump water heater the way they do, by law, if you have an electrified space heating system. So in California, mostly utility bills either stay flat or go up. They stay flat in apartment complexes because there's such low heating bills that even if they give you more allowance, you don't use it. So it works then to go towards the heat pump water heater. Apartment complexes is pretty much a break even one way or the other. You don't mm. need solar. Mm -hmm. Space, once you get into single family homes, which have pretty large space heating bills because they have so many exposed surfaces, they use their allowance. You don't have anything left over for the water heater. That's when you want to have a tiny, just a tiny amount of solar, less than a kilowatt, less than just like a couple of panels mm -hmm. is more than enough. Mm. You don't need a big solar array. You need like one kilowatt. Top. I see. <laughs> and I see. more than that's gravy. So in other words, there's a lot of ways you can do this. It's not just one, like you just have to get solar panels on the roof and you get mid zero, but there are many ways that we can do to decarbonize and start cleaning our yeah. environment. You know, I think that the, the electric vehicle push that started in California in 1994 and really mm -hmm. sped up over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that for a long time is how people imagine decarbonizing. And so yeah. people would like save up and then they would get an electric car. Mm -hmm. The same thing for your home. Like this, we shouldn't imagine that we're just going to get a $20,000 home loan and decarbonize our whole house. You could do that, but that's not the most common way. More commonly, like you said, people are going to have something that's breaking or just broke and they need to replace it. And so now is the time to spend money and I'm going to get the electrified version. That means you have like a, like an eight year horizon, like you could get your whole house done by 2030 and that would be great for the planet. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't, you're not personally responsible for all of the harm of the world, but you are personally responsible for like when you can <laughs> yes. do better. Yes. You know? So um, that I think is like a, a sustainable approach to it. Right. Well, you have shared so many incredibly helpful information uh, for us, but is there any way where that you have all these resources available. I know your website has some really incredible uh, resources available. So can you tell us where we can find some information about all these uh, great electric uh, appliances and systems and incentives? Yes. <laughs> uh, so redwoodenergy.net. We were paid by um, a nonprofit called Menlo Spark down in the Bay Area as they were leading about 25 of the 55 electric mm. ordinances that we've had in California. So they hired us to write these um, for the normal people books. You know, so yeah, we're all engineers. We understand engineering, but I'm a science teacher by training. And I wanted mm. to make this like the best textbook ever with all cute pictures of people smiling at us <laughs> and lots of case studies that are kind of small and fun to read. And in the back is where all the answers are, like in your math book. And so it's it's all the types of heat pump water here. It's all the different types of spacing systems, induction ranges. It's not an exhaustive catalog, but it is a comprehensive. So every single gas using system from lawn mowers to, to sauna heaters to hot tub, wow. water, like all of it. Mm -hmm. So that anything that breaks or anything that you're gonna get that might use gas, there's the option. Would you like a snowmobile? There are electric snowmobiles. Do you want a gas jet ski? Get an electric jet ski. You know, oh. you want electric bikes, electric cars, electric trucks, like whatever it is you need, stop buying the gas version. And in the back of the booklets, after all the charming, interesting, pretty pictures stuff is the technical manual. And there's nothing else like it. No one else has tried even to publish a comprehensive a catalog, like a flower catalog or a field guide to your favorite frogs like, it's like <laughs> if you would like to learn about the stuff here's the stuff and, and there's pictures of it <laughs> so that's on redwoodenergy.net you can find that that booklet that's great well, yeah Five thank you now. two on phones 
two on apartments, one on commercial buildings, it's all there. No excuses. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, John. This was so fun and helpful. And um, I can't wait to share this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was Sean Armstrong with Energy, uh, Redwood Energy. And this was Izumi Tanaka with Home Green Homes podcast. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. Tons of fun. Take care.